بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Sheikh Ahmed Pira, Pastor Eric Pop, it is a great pleasure and a great honor for me to welcome you all to this gathering here tonight in the debate between our well-known, renowned Muslim scholar Ahmed Pira from South Africa and the well-known Danish priest who has often attracted the eye of the media because of his sternness in his opinion and his bravery to speak it out, Pastor Eric Koch in the, in the debate tonight here in Denmark, the first of its kind with the we can say with an open topic like this. And I'd like to, to, to greet you with the oldest greeting that we know, the peace greeting, peace be upon you. Assalamu salamu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum. We will start tonight by listening to Sheikh Ahmed Tidat giving his first his first ideas on tonight's topic and he will speak for approximately 50 minutes. After this, the word will be given to Mr. Eric Buck and he will have one full hour at his disposal in which he can give his answer to Sheikh Ahmed Tida. After that, the word will again be given to Sheikh Ahmed Tira and he will have another 10 minutes to give his brief off on what Eric Buck may eventually have raised of issues that need a direct answer. So, I'm happy to give the word to Sheikh Ahmed Tira. Mr. Chairman, respected pastor, and my dear brothers and sisters, Thomas Carlyle made a great mistake. Who is Thomas Carlyle? Thomas Carlyle happens to be one of the greatest thinkers of the past century. A European, a Britisher, most specifically a Scottish Presbyterian. In 1840, he delivered a series of talks in England under the theme Heroes and Hero Worship. Heroes and Hero Worship. And the first section of his talks was dedicated to the hero as God. And the gods that he discusses are the gods of the Scandinavians. The people, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, they had their gods before Christianity reached them. Like the gods of ancient Greece. Gods and goddesses 
who ate and drank, who wrangled and plotted, carried away the wives of other gods, like the gods of the Hindus. The Scandinavians also had their own gods in their mythology, in their fairy tales. Odin, Thors, Wardens, these are the gods of the ancient Scandinavians. He deals with that and heroes as military men, then as heroes as prophet, the hero prophet. He chooses, this Thomas Carlyle, he chose our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the holy prophet Muhammad as his hero prophet. Amazing. A Christian, a Presbyterian, talking to his English Christian audience and he does not present to them Moses as his hero prophet or David as his hero prophet or Solomon or Jesus, but he chooses Muhammad as his hero prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Amazing situation. He was about the first European to do some justice. He tried to do some justice to our Nabi Akadim. He said that the lies which well-meaning zeal has heaped around this man are disgraceful to ourselves only. That the people were trained to hate the man Muhammad and his religion. And he goes out of his way to prove to the contrary that this man is great. A mighty messenger of God. But he was wrong, I said. Because at the start of his talk on the hero prophet, he makes known that in the history of the world, there will not again be any man ever so great whom his fellow men will take for a God. In other words, mankind has reached an intellectual level. Humanity as a whole, he assumed that they have reached an intellectual level where they will never acknowledge another human being as God. That is the mistake he made. That's what he said. In other words, we are very clever now. We all are very clever. We won't accept another man as a God anymore. Never mind what the man does. The man comes to you and you say, look, I can fly in the air like a bird around the hall. Mm-hmm. And he comes back. Are you prepared to accept that man as your God? No. The man says, come, come, come. We go to the mortuary, to the hospital, and I call the people out of the dead, and they all come out. Will you accept the man as God? No. The man shows you in the palm of his hand and says, look, look, look. Like a TV. Look, you can see your wife, what she's doing at home. Can you see? Can you recognize her? He said, yes. Now, ex, believe that I'm your God. He says, no, you're not my God. Why? He says, because when I look at you, me, for example, he says, you know, this man is about 70 years old. Now, man, what I do? I can read your mind. I can tell you the notes, the coroners that you got in your pocket, and I can give the numbers. Believe that I'm your God. He says, no, sir, I don't know how you do all these things, but when I look at you, I can see that you're about 70 years old. Before 70, you were not here. You won't be here for another 70, that's definite. I don't know whether you last another 7, I don't know. If I had a knife, I can put it through you and kill you. I can strangle you, I can shoot you. You are not my God. You are not the creator of the heavens and the earth. How you do all these miraculous things, I don't know. I don't understand. That is the intellectual development of mankind today. That's what he said. But after he spoke this, that's 150 years ago in 1840, There are people on earth, they are worshipping men and monkeys, elephants and snakes. In America, Father Divine, an Afro-American, with the white man and the black man, we are worshipping him as God. Sun Myung Moon, the Korean, there are people who are worshipping him as a God. They are worshipping the devil, Satan, worshipping cult in America. And in the world today, there are more polytheists in the world, people who are worshipping men and monkeys, elephants and snakes on God's good earth today, then the worshippers of the one true God. So, Carlyle was wrong. He assumed that we had reached that intellectual le- development where we will not accept another human being as God. But today there are people who worship other human beings as gods. And the topic for this evening, of course, you know, is Jesus. Is Jesus God? And there are over one billion people on earth who say Jesus Christ is God incarnate. God Almighty who came down to earth as a man. And they 
and they are the most knowledgeable people. People who land on the moon and they're making the Mars and Jupiter probes. They monitor the world like, like, like a, things in their hands, on their fingertips. They know what's going on in the world. But they still, despite all that, they still worship another human being as God. Now, what we want to establish is this. Before we confer divinity upon anybody, there is a rational question. Did the man claim to be God? Number one, we want to know whether the person made the claim. We have no right to say Quisling. You know the guy in Norway who was selling his country to the Germans, Quisling. What's the name? Quisling. That guy, let's say there is a Quisling cult in Norway. They say that the Quisling was the Messiah. He was the Messiah. And this cult grows and it overtakes Sweden and Denmark and the whole of Europe. They said, no, he was God. First question we have to ask is that this guy Quisling, did he claim to be God? Hitler! Some cult starts growing in Germany. New Nazis are once more on the warpath. Races are on the warpath again. And let's say it grows, the sickness grows. And 90 million Germans one day just said, Hitler was the Messiah. He was God incarnate. The sensible thing to do is to ask a simple question. Did Hitler say he was God? The answer is no. Did Quisling say he was God? The answer is no. Did Jesus say he is God? The answer is no. Simple, simple as that. Did the man claim divinity? If he claimed, then we have to analyze. What is God? What does it mean? It's not just a word. It means something. What does it mean? That this God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. We have to accept. That God means we are talking about not just giving a God with a capital G or a God with a small g. So, well, you know, he is very great, so we call him a God. That means nothing. God means we have to understand that the creator of the heavens and the earth, the unseen God of the universe, who is most merciful, who is most kind. These are his qualities in the Bible, in the Quran, that he is a spiritual being. Jesus said, God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in truth and in spirit, not in form, shape or size. Jesus is in form, shape and size. Qualities of God. What is God? So once we have established what we are looking for, I am putting forth to the pastor an offer. The source of your authority, the Christian authority, is the Holy Bible. Now if the pastor or anybody here in the audience can show me in his or her Bible a statement made by Jesus where he says, I am God, worship me. That's all. Just show it to me. In any Bible. Swedish, Danish, English, whatever. Whatever version. Jehovah's Witness version, Roman Catholic version, Authorized King James version, Revised Standard version, any version of the Bible on earth. Just show me where Jesus says, I am God, where he says, worship me, and I am prepared to accept him as God, and I am prepared to worship him. I'm not speaking for you people. I have no right to speak on your behalf. I speak for myself. I am prepared to put my neck under the guillotine. You show me and chop off my head. You want to baptize me? Tonight, I'm prepared to go with you, wherever you take me. If there's a swimming pool around, I don't mind in this cold winter to go in and come out baptized. It is as easy as that. Easy. You can't be something easier than that. Just show me that Jesus says, I am God. He says, worship me. And believe me, my neck is safe. Believe me. Because I offered this to Pastor Stanley in, in Stockholm. And he failed. He said, while I'm talking, he said, I shall I show it to you? I said, no, 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 you have your time. Look, he's going to have an hour. 
So you want to, there and there, I said, no, no, you have your time, you'll have your hour. And the hour passed. So my last 10 minutes, I said, look, you haven't done it yet. I have put my neck on the block and you have not been able to chop it off. Because it's not there. The man never claimed divinity. Not only he didn't claim that he is not God, but he was so humble. Jesus Christ was so humble that a young Jew comes to him, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. A young Jew comes to him and says, I'm reading, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, teacher, in Hebrew, Rabbi, Mawli Sahib, Sheikh, Imam. That's what he said. Good master, what good thing shall I do to, that I may have eternal life? That in the hereafter I have Jannah. What good thing must I do? That's the question. Instead of answering him, what he must do, Jesus says. And he, Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? What you calling me good for? There is none good except one that is God. Even goodness is not prepared to accept. Goodness belongs to God. God is good. He is all good. Me, I am a humble fellow. A humble teacher. Don't start pouring all these good words upon me. I don't deserve it. As a man, I admire the man. As a prophet, I admire the prophet. If he said that. You tell me, you say, no, Mr. D. Dot is the Billy Graham. Says, they have been advertising in Stockholm before I came. It's the, the Billy Graham of the Muslims and his Mr. D. Dot is Jimmy Swaggart of the Muslims and all kinds of nonsense. I said, look, please, man, leave all this thing out. You know, look, I am a humble fellow. You know, I have been talking, talking, and I talk myself into this position. I didn't go to Al-Azhar or to any university. I am not academically, not an educated man in that we find in the audience here. I'm not in any way like that. This is humility. We will accept from any man. Humbleness. But if the man is God, and he says, why call us army good? Then it is not befitting. He is God, and he says, don't call me even good. What kind of a God is this? Because God is all good. Now, here is something. This... I'll leave it with the pastor. You know, easier reference. He does not have to start paging through Matthew so and so. so. Uh, as I go along, I will hand it over, the references and the verses, so he does not have to open the Bible to verify. <laughs> now, the absurdity of the claim that Jesus Christ is God. If he is God, if he is God, in inverted commas, then the birth of God is described in the Bible. If he's God. Birth of a man, we don't mind. But if he's God, then we take exception to what we read. God being born, so God was created from the seed of David. Can you imagine? God was created from the seed of David. And you read about David in the Bible. Stories which no Muslim will accept. His seed. God is the seed of, this is what the Bible says. Concerning his son Jesus, I'm reading book of Romans, chapter 1 verse 3. I'll give it to the pastor just now. Concerning his son, God's son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now this is what Paul is writing. Our Lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. It's not metaphorical. It means actually his seed according to flesh. It's not metaphorical. Literal. According to the flesh means literally he is the son of David. His seed passed on from man to man, man to man, till it reached his mother and he was so born. God being the son of David, it, he say, is making a mockery of God. His kingdom, God's kingdom extends over the heavens and the earth. Every religious man says so, believes so. But in the Bible, we are told, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verse 33, and he, Jesus, shall reign over the house of Jacob. 
the Jews. He's only going to rule over the Jews. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth, but his kingdom is restricted to the house of Jacob, Yaakov alayhi salam. He had 12 sons and the 12 tribes of Israel, the Jews. His kingdom only extends over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. But we know, at the moment, the Jews are ruling in the seat of David. Who are sitting there? The Jews. Not Jesus. But it was forever. It's cut off. It was supposed to be forever. <laughs> so what does ever mean in your language? You know what it means? Ever means ever. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Uh, here is another passage through. God Almighty, according to the belief of the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims, He is all-knowing, He knows everything. But we read in the scriptures, if He is God, we are taking exception to that He is God. If you say He is God, then we are now producing this evidence to say He is not God. But of that day, His knowledge, the knowledge of God is limited. If he's God, as a man, our knowledge is limited. We don't know when the Yawm Qiyamah, the last day, the day of resurrection is going to take place. Nobody knows. But God ought to know. So if he is God, this is what the Bible says. But of that day, Jesus is saying, he says, of that day, that hour, knoweth no man, nobody knows. No, not the angels, even the angels don't know which are in heaven, neither the sun, I don't know, He's talking about himself as the sun, neither the sun, but the father, only Allah knows, only God knows. If he is God, then what pretense is this? He doesn't know. In knowledge, he is not like God. In power, he is not like God. What makes him God? We want to know. Everything that is being told to us is that he is not God. He is human, human, human. Not only that in his knowledge he is not like God, but in ordinary knowledge he is also deficient. Ordinary knowledge. Let me read it. Mark chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. It says, And on the morrow, next day, when they were come from Bethany, he, Jesus, was hungry. Can you imagine a hungry God? <laughs> huh? Please, look, now this is what the book is saying. That he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, he saw a fig tree in the distance, full of leaves. Because he saw the leaves, he came. If happily, happily, he might find figs thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. It was out of season. Why didn't he find figs? He sees the fig tree, is hungry, so he runs to it. Look, he didn't know that there were no figs on, as God he ought to have known. But look, he didn't know. Maybe the hunger drove him. He ran up to it and he sees there's no leaves. And so no figs. Why? Luke tells us, because it was out of season. Didn't Jesus know figs were out of season? Look, you don't have to be a god. You don't have to be a horticulturist. To know these simple things, you come to my country in June, July, and say so you want leeches. Beautiful food, beautiful food. So we'll do it. So where you come from? He said, Denmark. I said, Oh, no leeches, you'll get Christmas time. Certain fruits, only certain time. Certain fruits is in winter, the summer now. There is summer at the moment. You don't get this mandarins. He said, No, that you get it in winter. You don't have to be a god, you don't have to be a farmer, you don't have to be a horticulturist. It's common knowledge. People ought to know what fruit is in season and what is not. This mighty messenger of God, I don't know how they put it, that he didn't even know that figs were out of season and he's expecting fruit. And when there's no fruit, what does he do? He gets angry with the tree and he curses that he should wither and die. Can you imagine? He's, that tree is following his father's law. God Almighty. Is following the law of God. In season must bear fruit, out of season you don't bear fruit. Now he's expecting something to go against the nature of the tree. And because it doesn't go against his own nature, he curses it and the tree withers and dies. Next day, Peter coming forth, he says, Master, the tree which thou hast cursed has withered and died. For what? For following the law of God. Again, this is what they say about Jesus. 
in the Bible, Matthew chapter 21 verse 18. That is described as a hungry God. God in inverted from us. And this is what they say. I don't say that. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. A God, look, as a man we hunger and we thirst. But as a God, he hungered. Matthew 21, 18. And again, and on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Chapter 11, verse 12 of Mark. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. Now, the quality of God are described in the Holy Quran, or more exactly, Jesus. His qualities are described. The Quran says, Mal Masihubnu Mariyama illa Rasul. Most certainly, Messiah, translated Christ, Jesus. The son of Mary is no more than a messenger. Qad khalat min qablihi rusul. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. Wa ummuhu siddiqa. And his mother was a virtuous woman, a saintly woman. This is the testimony in the Quran about Jesus and his mother. And his mother was a saintly woman. Kana ya'kulani ta'am. And they both ate food. So what? We all eat food. No. This is to bring to your attention that there are people who are worshipping Mary, the mother of Jesus, as the mother of God. The Roman Catholic Church. Jesus, the mother of Mary is worshipped as the mother of God. As goddess. And the Christian world worshipping Jesus as God. So Allah says they both add food. So what? Allah says, Unzur, see, Kaifa you know lahum See, I'm, I'm making my signs clear to you. The message plain to you. Summanzur, he says, have another look. Anna yufikun, how they have deviated from the path. Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 78. In other words, Allah is telling us in a most diplomatic language that they add food. See, have another look. What? That if you eat food, you are dependent. God is independent. If you eat food, you have a call of nature. You run to the toilet. And if there's no toilet, you run to the rocks and the bushes around you. And the flies start buzzing around you. This is not the quality of God. Allah doesn't spell it out for you, but that's unzur. See, summanzur, have another look. What? What are you talking about? God eating food, his mother, a goddess eating food and running to the toilet. Please, 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 don't do that. This is in Arabic. I don't know. It won't, ah, these are all, it won't help. It won't help. Again, the book says, John, chapter 19, verse 28. He saith, Jesus says, I thirst. I thirst. Look, a man thirst. I'm thirsting now. Take it. You don't mind. But God thirst, thirsting, it does not befit God. See, that's why we say, look, everything about him is human, human, human. And again, if he is God, it says here, Matthew chapter 8, verse 24, he was asleep. God was asleep. And Luke chapter 8, 23, he fell asleep. And again, Mark chapter 4, verse 38, it says, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. God, God sleeping. He feels sleepy, drowsy. Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, in Ayatul Kursi, he says, neither slumber nor sleep overtaketh him. This is God. No sleep, no slumber. He doesn't get, get fatigued in guarding and cherishing his create, creation. Allah la ilaha illahu al hayyul kayyum la ta'akhuzuhu sinatum wa Neither slumber nor sleep overtake him. This is my God. This is God. A, God. a person who feels sleepy can never be your God. He sleeps on a pillow or without a pillow. He's not your God. <laughs> then this God, if he is God, in inverted commas, it tells us about his transport on earth. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, very meek, Jesus comes, very meek, and sitting upon an ass in a donkey. Transport of God, a donkey. And he's very meek. 
And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, donkey, sat there on. John chapter 12, verse 14. He's very meek and he is using the donkey for his transport. The warring God is out for a war, for a fight. The strong arm method of God, in inverted commas, God. And when he went into the temple, Jesus, and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought. As a man, a righteous man, who was irritated by misbehavior of his people, understood. But as a God, his behavior is uncalled for. He's throwing people out, and again, in John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he made a whip. And with this whip, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep, and the oxen, and poured out the changes money, the money changes, and overthrew their tables. Now, this type of strong arm tactics, you know, belongs to the SS, not to a man of God. As a man of as a human being, yes, but God doing such things, Making a whip and going beating people out of the temple. And the Bible describes this God in inverted commas. I said in inverted commas. I'm not saying so. It describes him. He says here, the quality of God. He says, God cannot be tempted. You can't tempt God. Make him to do things for you the way, what, the way you want it. So look uh, if, you, if you don't do me this favor, you know I'm going to become a Hindu. You know, if you don't make a, do me this favor, I will say you don't exist. You can't tempt God. So James, chapter 1, verse 13, in the book, in the Holy Bible, it says, God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. He doesn't tempt anybody, nor can anybody tempt him. But in the book of Hebrews, again in the Bible, chapter 4, verse 15, we are told, but he, Jesus, was in all points tempted like as we are. Can you imagine? God doesn't tempt, we are told. Now, not only Jesus, he was Jesus, if he is God, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. We believe that all the prophets of God are sinless. But Jesus was tempted like anybody else. If he is God, he can't be tempted. Next talks about the book talks about the spiritual development of God. That God spiritually he develops, he evolves, he becomes clever, like you and me. We have experience. So he says here, Luke chapter 2, verse 40. And the child grew, Jesus, he grew and waxed strong in spirit. His knowledge waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. God, getting filled with wisdom, is waxing, getting fatter and fatter and more knowledge. God, God is self-knowing. This is the quality of God that his knowledge is his own. He doesn't grow in knowledge that, you know, he has to go through a school or a university or hard knocks of life to make him a better God. He doesn't need that. That is not the quality of God. Then again, Luke chapter 2, verse 52, we are told, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. God increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He is God but is in favor with God and man. Sir. So, and we read the devil tempted God if he is God. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days Tempted of Satan. Shaitan was tempting him, making him to think and believe things which he ought not to have done. How can a devil tempt God? A weeping God. Can you imagine God weeping, crying, like a little baby? Astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive. John chapter 11, verse 35, it says, This is something, if you remember, you can win a Bible quiz. You'll gain win a prize. Just remember this. The shortest sentence in the Bible. If they ask you, what is the shortest sentence in the Bible? Remember this. Two words. Jesus wept. That's all. That's the shortest sentence in the Bible. He wept. Yembezi. You know, in Zulu this is Yembezi. You know. John chapter 11 verse 35. Why did he weep? It tells us. A beautiful story. 
which proves again that Jesus is not God. You see, it tells us, John chapter 11, that his friend Lazarus had died. A friend of Isa alayhi salam. He had died. And he was not there in the village at the time. So after three days, he goes to the village and the sisters of Lazarus, they tell him, he says, you know, master, if you were here with us, you know, you might have by a miracle saved my brother from dying. You know, you heal other people, you raise the dead, my, friend, my brother and your friend, you know, if you were here, you might have saved his life. So Jesus says, even now, if you have faith, ye shall see the glory of God. You shall see the, the power of God. You will still see even now, if you have got faith. So saying, he said, where have you laid him? Come, take me to him. So they start walking all together, going towards the cemetery, the sepulchre, a big roomy chamber above ground, not a grave. This is where Lazarus was put, according to the Bible. So he is walking up to the place with friends. And while he's walking up, he's crying. Jesus wept. And he groaned in the spirit. The Bible says, he groaned. It means he's crying to Allah. Ya Baritala, oh my Lord, you know my friend, my dear friend who is dead. You know if you can bring him back to life. He's crying, he's talking to Allah, he's talking to God. But because the people couldn't hear his words being articulated, because he was crying to himself, within himself, he's talking, oh my Lord, you know, help me. So they say he groaned. I say he didn't groan. He was actually pouring his heart out to God. So saying, he reaches the sepulchre and he lifts up his eyes towards heaven and he says, Oh my father, I know that thou hast heard me. What? The prayer. That groaning. He was talking to Allah. I know that thou hast heard me and I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people that stood by, these superstitious, credulous people, they will think that I am God. I have given life back to the dead. Therefore, I am putting up an act that they may not make a mistake. Why am I doing all this act? I want you to know, it's not me. I know that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people that stood by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. You are sent. It's you who are working. It's you who are doing the miracles. So saying, he says, remove the stone in the opening of the sepulchre. And he shouts, Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out. Who gave life back to Lazarus? God. God Almighty is doing the works. And Peter, the one who was given the authority to feed, spiritually guide his sheep, his flock. He said, Peter, in your hands are the keys of heaven. Peter, feed my flock. Peter, feed my sheep. This Peter in the book of Acts, he says, Ye men of Israel, O Jews, he's addressing the Jews, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, which ye also know. Who did it? God did by him. He's using him as an instrument, as anybody would use it. Say, look, put on the switch or put it off. You are not supplying the power. The power is coming from the power station. You are only an instrument of pressing the button or releasing the button. That's what he does. Whatever God commands him to do, he agrees with him, it's right. He does the job and he says, I by the finger of God cast out devils. I by the spirit of God do these things. Where did he say, this power is mine, I have done it on my own strength? No way. No way. Jesus Christ, imagine he is God, if he is God as the Christians say, but this is what he says. John chapter 5 verse 31. He said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. If I say, look, I am so and so, I am the... My witness is not valid, he says. John 5.31. Then John 8.13 and 14 says, that the Jews come to him and quote his own words. They put his words back into his mouth. They say the Pharisees, means the priest of the Jews, Therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. Only his own words. This is what Jesus said in 531. So now they're telling him, say hey, you, self-praise has no recommendation. Because you know, 
it's worthless rubbish. Self-praise has no recommendation. That's what Jesus said. Now they said, you know, self-praise has no recommendation. If you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. That's what you said. So now Jesus says, but he answered, he said, Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. Look, he just said, if I bear witness of myself, it is not true. Now he said, no, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. <laughs> the man has to make up his own mind. Do prophets lie? You are being God. Do prophets lie? Jesus Christ, he's speaking about John the Baptist. The Jews had a prophecy that before the coming of the Messiah, Elias, Elias, Elijah will come first. So they asked him, they said, look, you say you are the Messiah. Where is Elias? Where is Elias? Where is Elijah? Same name. So Jesus says, he says about John the Baptist. Yahya alayhi salam. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, he says, Verily I say unto you, most surely I am telling you, among those born of women, means a human being, there has not risen another greater than John the Baptist. The greatest of the Jewish prophets is Yahya alayhi salam, John the Baptist. Among those born of women, there has not risen another greater than John the Baptist. And again he says, in 11.14, And if ye will receive it, this is Elijah. John is Elijah. If you accept what I'm telling you, he is Elijah. Matthew 11, 14. But now when we find in the first chapter of John, book of John, verse 19 and 21, the Jews come to Jesus, and to John the Baptist, and they ask him a number of questions. Among them, verse 21, and they ask him, what then are you, Elijah? Jesus said, he's Elijah, the man you are waiting for. They're asking now John, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. The mightiest messenger of God on earth, according to Jesus, he is denying Jesus. He says, Jesus says, this man is Elijah, and Elijah says, I'm, John says, I'm not. Between the two, who is speaking the truth? Can you imagine somebody asking Pastor Eric, Bob, where's d -Dad? Who's d -Dad? So he points to me, that's d -Dad. And they ask me, you ask me, are you d -Dad? He says, no. Either he is lying or I'm lying. Am I right? He says, I'm d -Dad, and I say, I'm not. Or I say, he's Pastor Bob, and he says, he's not. Either I'm lying or he's lying. One of us is definitely not speaking the truth. Between John and Jesus, the mightiest of the Israelite prophets and Jesus Christ himself, one of the mightiest messengers of God. Between them now, Jesus says he's Elijah and John says I'm not. Who is speaking the truth? We wouldn't like the pastor to tell us between the two. We Muslims, we are not to enter into this kind of controversy. It's not for us. Between the prophets of God, we are not going to judge who is true and who is false. That's not our job. But it is for the Christians to tell us who, between Jesus and John, who is speaking the truth. God Almighty is all-powerful. He can do what he pleases. But Jesus says, I can of my own self do nothing. God can do everything. If he's God, he says, I can of my own self do nothing. John chapter 5 verse 30. But Jesus says, Mark chapter 10 verse 27. But looking at them, Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but with, with God but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Whatever he wants to do, he is the doer of all he intends. Allah Ta'ala, God Almighty, he does what he pleases. Nobody can come in his way. He is irresistible, supreme. Jesus says he can do nothing and he testifies that God can do everything. He can't be God. Jesus can't be God. Then the racial connotations about Jesus. You see, we are against, especially the Scandinavian countries, we are very grateful to them for the fight they put up against South Africa, the whites of South Africa. They have been oppressing us for 300 years, the whites, white Christian rulers, the most regular churchgoers, greatest races of any people on earth. And the Scandinavians, they came to the rescue. They have been passing sanctions and everything they did. And the country, the white race is changing in South Africa. Alhamdulillah. But now, 
this racism, where did they get it from? Here, yeah. in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 5. God, in inverted commas, was a tribal Jew. It says, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah means Jews. Can you imagine God being the lion of the tribe of Judah? Then Matthew 15, 24 says, But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, only for the Jews. He is a racist. According to what he says, I am only sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I want to know where the Danes fit in, and where the Swedes fit in, and the, and the Germans fit in. Are you all the lost tribes of the house of Israel? No, no, answer that. His titles, his titles as God, if he's God. Matthew 2 2, he is the king of the Jews. A title of God, king of the Jews. John chapter 1 verse 49 and chapter 12 verse 13. He is the king of Israel, king of the Jews. According to Jesus, if he is God, the Gentiles are dogs. Gentiles mean all who are non Jews are all dogs. All of us, unless you say you are a Jew, you are his children. Otherwise, all dogs, whether you are a Danish or a Spanish or whatever you are. It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Matthew chapter 15 verse 26. How can God Almighty treat his creation as dogs? But this is what the book records. That he treated all known Jews as dogs and pigs even. He said, do not throw that which is holy into dogs. Do not throw pearls before swine, lest they turn and rend you. Racial discrimination. Brother Eric, you see, we have to come back to the basics. The basic is, this mighty messenger of God, we in Islam, we believe that he was a mighty messenger of God. He was the Messiah. He was born miraculously. He gave life to the dead by God's permission. And he healed those born blind in the lepers by God's permission. We have no qualms about accepting all that. The only real difference between us is that we Muslims, we say that he's not God Almighty in human form. As a man, as a messenger, we must love him, respect him, revere him, follow him. But don't worship him. Because he at no time did he say, worship me. No time he claimed divinity. On the contrary, we will be able to confirm that when he was in dire straits, when he's supposed to be having on the cross, when he's supposed to have been on the cross, he cried out with a loud voice, I'm quoting, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He is God himself. If he is God himself, who is he crying to? How can you cry to yourself that you forsook yourself? If, how can you forsake yourself? If you want to get out, you can get out. Why has thou forsaken me? And he's crying to Allah. He's crying to Allah. See the word, Allah, Allah, lama sabachthani, translated, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? That word there is Allah, Allah, in Hebrew, it is Allah, Allah, lama sabachtani. In Arabic, Allah, Allah, lama taraktani. This is the name of God which he worshipped. Allah. You ask the Jehovah's Witnesses. You have a lot of them, I understand, in the Scandinavian countries. A lot more than anybody. They are full of life and vigor. The Jehovah's Witnesses. And they come to tell everybody. They are Christians. They say they are Christians. And they say the rest of Christians in them are pagans, mushriks. They say, we are not saying that. They say that the name of God is Jehovah. I'm sure you must have heard that. Ask the fellow. Next time you come across such people, I'm also informing you, sir. Ask the fellow, where did you get this word Jehovah from? He says, it's in the Bible. So what does the Bible say? In the Hebrew Bible, in the original manuscript, is the word Jehovah there? And the guy will tell you no. He will tell you. Then what is there? He will tell you, he said, there is a tetragrammaton. In English, he will tell you there is a tetragrammaton. So what is a tetragrammaton? You know, I have come across doctors and lawyers, professors, at the Illinois University in America, and asking them, 
Anybody here who knows what is the tetragrammaton? And believe me, there was one, not one lecturer, American, who knew what it was. I said, funny, every Tom, Dick, and Harry among the Jehovah's Witnesses, they know the word tetragrammaton. And you don't know? No, it's a special word. They have concocted, invented. Tetragrammaton. What is tetragrammaton? Tetra means four, and grammaton means letters. Four-letter word. Then why don't you call a four-letter word a four-letter word? Why do you have to tantalize people with a 14-letter word to tell us tetragrammaton when you say four-letter word? You know why? Because in English, when you say the four-letter word, it gives you another meaning. In my country, Lady Chatterley's Lover, a book, Lady Chatterley's Lover was banned for 20 years because of one four-letter word. I, I, I hope you can guess what I'm talking about. Four-letter word. You understand? If you don't, ask your neighbor. When the lecture is over, what is this four-letter word? They'll tell you. So, what are those four letters? It says, Y-H-W-H. In Hebrew, yot ha vav ha I said, these are consonants. Y-H-W-H. You can't produce a sound. Without vowels, you can't produce a sound. Add the vowels. Anyhow, as you like. Whatever they do, they can never get a J. Where did you get the J from? Jehovah. Where did you get the J from? J is another consonant. At the vowels, it becomes Yahuwah. What is Yahuwah? Yah in Arabic and Hebrew means O. Yah. Hua in Arabic means He. And Hu in Hebrew means He. Yahuwah means O. He. Hu. Elohim. El in Hebrew means God. Elah in Hebrew means God. An alternative spelling, Allah, it's here in the Bible. This one here is by Schofield, J.J. Schofield, Reverend Schofield, D.D., Doctor of Divinity, backed by nine other D.D.'s, not D.D.'s, D.D.'s. <laughs> they tell us here, first book of the Bible, Genesis, first chapter, first verse. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word God has got a number given. You look down, down in the commentary and it'll tell you it's El, Ella, and also alternatively A-L-A-H. Ella. We are only telling the Christians, look, spell it as you like. But my language, I want you to try to pronounce as you ought to pronounce. A-L-A-H is Allah, not Allah. Say, say, Allah, all of you. Say, Allah, Allah. See, not Allah. But you can write A-L-A-H, but don't say Allah, say Allah. So, Allah. So, she says, El, Allah, Jesus is crying. Allah, Allah, lama taraktani. He says, oh my Allah, oh my Allah, why have you forsaken me? This is the name of God. And this is the God that Jesus worshipped. He's telling his people, come, I will teach you how to pray. He said, pray like this. O oh, our Father, which art in heaven, yours and mine, including Judas. Judas was in the group, the traitor. He is the father of everybody. The sinner and the saint means he's the Lord, cherisher, sustainer, evolver of everybody. O oh, our Father, which art in heaven, not the Father of Jesus Christ in heaven, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where does he claim, exclusive claim to God Almighty that he is his Father? If he called him my Father, his. Before he said that the first time, look at the Gospel of St. Matthew. As soon as you start chapter 1, verse 1, you start reading there and you'll find the expression, your Father, thy Father, your father, thy father, 13 times before one time he says, my father. Can you imagine? 13 times he said, God Almighty is your father. Similar. Oh, my time, sir. 13 times he says, your father, thy. Thy means singular. Your means more than one. Addressing more people. Your, thy father, your father. Thy father, your father. 13 times before one time he said, my father. But amazing, people only see the one time and they don't see the 13. He says, come brothers, come let us reason together and inshallah we'll find a way of understanding each other's points of views. You don't have to be converted. You don't have to convert us. We won't convert you. We can't convert. Nobody can really convert. 
This is in the hands of God. But at least we can understand each other's points of views so we become more tolerant. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Sheikh Ahmed Didat, he's a scholar, he's a learned man. I'm not a scholar. I've studied theology for eight years, but I'm not so clever in the scriptures as is Sheikh Ahmed Didat. So, We have come together t t this evening to, um, to meet each other. And I'm, I'm not interested in convincing you to Christianity, trying to convert you. We worship one God. And Ahmed... He has precisely shown us where this God is crying out his name on the cross. Eli Ali, Allah, Allah. We worship the same God, but we are different. We express ourselves in a different language. And Christianity is much more ancient than Jesus Christ. Because Christianity has taken from heathen a lot of rituals, the two sacraments, in the Bible, in the New Testament, for us Protestants are the baptism, to be baptized to Jesus Christ, to his death, in order to become resurrected with him at the end of the days, because he will surely come to us and lead us to the other side. This is our belief. He is our savior. And because Christ is not created like things, like animals, he is created and is of the being of his father. Moses, he is in the wilderness and he's pasturing the goats and sheep. And then he sees a um, burning bush. And when he approaches, he hears a voice saying to him, draw off your shoes, this place is holy. And then Moses asked, who is speaking to him? And the voice says, I am. I am is sending you to Pharaoh to let my people go. And this holy name, which was forbidden for the Jews to pronounce, Yehweh, Yahweh, he is the God of our fathers. The Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. This is the God who chose Ibrahim, Abraham, 
and promised him a people like the stars of the heaven and the sand at the sea. And so we are assembled here, a big people, which count in millions, but still will be multiplying itself. We have not yet reached the number of the stars and the sand of the seas. For thousands of years, we are going to live. And I should think that for thousands of years, so different we are, because we have a history which is soaked in blood. There has been war, holy war between Jews, Christians, Muslims. And most of the time, the Jews have been persecuted by the Christians, and I think also of the Muslims. But Christians and Muslims have been to fight for thousand years. It may go on. This hate will continue. But there is another vision. There are visions that we shall assemble in Jerusalem, all of us, and praise our Lord. I will now say something about the claims of uh, being God. Is Jesus God? And I'll go back to the first. When we hear of Jesus, when he himself is speaking, in the New Testament, Yengil, we hear Jesus as 12 years of age in the temple of Jerusalem. And his father and mother ha has not been able to find him. And then after having looked for him in three days, they find him in the temple. And there, this boy is sitting with the rabbis and the learned ones around him, and he's speaking with them. And they are dumbfounded by the wisdom with what, how he addresses them. So Jesus shows himself for the first time as the master of the word. He was the living word of God. And when the mother of Jesus asks him, why could you do this to us? He said to her, did you not know that I shall be in my father's house? My father. Jesus repeats it again and again. My father. And the prayer where we come at most close to Jesus is where he learns us the prayer Pater Noster. What do you say in English? Uh, our, our, our Lord's Prayer, yes. Our Lord's Prayer. And there he addresses God with Father, Abba, he says, like a boy, a child. 
And what he teaches us is to see the world like children, like the children we are. Because he went into God and he became God's son when he was baptized. Jesus is not sent to the world that we shall be worshipping him. In the church, we prostrate before the crucifix, but Jesus is not really there. He is not in the crucifix. He does not say, worship me. He says, remember me. And in the other sacrament we have in the church, the Holy Communion, we eat his body and we drink his blood. And if this is horrible to you, then you must remember that this ritual goes back in ancient history and is so much older than Christianity. And in this ritual, he gives himself to us because he had no other things to give. He was poor. But the last supper, he gives himself to the community in order that they shall remember him. And then he says, when he arises to the heavens, don't look after me. Look at the ground, at the people where you are, because I will surely be where one or three of you are gathered and you may even meet me in the man who needs you, who meets you in a hidden way on the street, in the stranger. Because Jesus is not imprisoned to his church and there is even a Christianity which is without a church. When Jesus asks his disciple who they think he is and they don't know what to say and he is expecting an answer, then Peter he says, you surely is the living Christ, Messiah. And we have two reports. The scriptures very often contradict each other or say the things in a different way. And in one of the textures in St. Matthew, Jesus praises Peter because he said this to him, that he was Messiah. In the other version from St. Mark and St. Luke, he says that they have to keep secret about it. They must not tell in the world because this truth is hidden. I think Jesus was not sure about his 
his relation to God. He was wavering all the time long, and we hear him in different situations. And when he really is trodden to the ground, he cries that God has forsaken him. Eli Eli, Lama Sabachthani, on the cross, he was forsaken by God. He feared it. Jesus was in pains and in horrors and in temptations, and he was thirsty, and he was sleeping, and he was desperate, and he became angry, and he suffered all the passions which a man in this world is suffering because he was a true man. And he himself did not know if he was son of God or he was not only when he arrived at Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples who do people say whom I am? And then they said, well, some say Elias, some say the resurrected John of Baptist, some say this, some say other things. Then he asked them, but whom do you believe? the Son of Man is. And um, then only Peter took courage and came with the confession, which is the Christian church. And on this word of Peter, Christ wanted to build his church And we have this visible church and churches, many of them in all Europe, all over, the, all over the world. But this visible church is not alone the Christian church. The church is invisible and is built it where man meets another man and brotherhood evokes in their hearts. And he said, you shall love your fellow man. And not even that, you shall even love your enemy. And this is the hardest task. This is difficult for everybody of us. But if we were able to, the world would change at once. How long time do I have? Hmm. The secrets of Jesus. The Church is full of secrets. In Islam, there are not so many secrets. Everything is plain. The Prophet Muhammad, he made a new religion. I read that he said at the end, I think, Surah 5, that in this way I have made you a religion, Islam, to follow. And naturally, you must love Muhammad, which your fathers have told you about. And I think naturally, we must love in our 
culture, we must love Jesus, our brother, and whom we call our savior. Because he is the son of man, we say. He is the one we bear in our heart by our love. Because we love him, we bear him in our heart. And when the time of our death is coming, we call for him. And then he comes from the inside of us. Because he is so close in many ways, he is the word himself in which we address each other. So I hear by what you had expected, know that I say Jesus is God. He is the greatest lover of this world because he was able to love man from here to the end of the world. And I think there is a truth in, in the death on the cross. There is a hidden truth. I know it is abhorrent to Muslims and it is also horrid very often for us to think that this so exceptional man, this poet, this lover, this filled with spirit and wisdom that he should hang on the cross we cannot understand how God could suffer it because he wouldn't suffer that Ishmael, your forefather, was killed or Isaac when Abraham, he wanted to slaughter his son but he suffered it when Jesus from Nazareth, he was killed. And I'm glad that the prophet, he loved also Jesus. Jesus Isa is dear to Muhammad. And we have come into the family from different roads. Muhammad, he tells you the way to go. Jesus, he says that the, the road is narrow. So you have to go to pass through your own self So, when he did die on the cross, he was not dying to show us an example that we should do the same thing as he. He showed us that we could be rid of the sins. He took it upon him. And he said, I and the Father, we are one, one in the Spirit. And in this way, he is, it seems that he goes into the throne of God and takes it. I and God, we are one in the Spirit because they're speaking from the same spirit.
And I think now uh, Ahmed did that. He put questions to me. And he said, now you have to choose what is truth and what is lie. One of us must be lying. And one is telling the truth. I think this is not so very strict, this who is speaking the truth, who is lying. Well, the words, they, they are spoken and you have to receive it. And you receive it in the spirit and the traditions that you are learned into. We are not worshipping a book. This is not what we believe in. The spirit is what we are looking for. And Ahmed Didat, he quoted what Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, that the true children of God, they do not worship here and there, but they are worshiping in spirit and wisdom. And it is what we shall do in the future. There have been wars between us. There has been hate. Blood has been spilled for centuries. But there has also been love amongst us because we have learned from each other. We will never be able to pay back what we got from the Arab world, Europe, when the Arabs, they had the texts of the philosophers, the Greek philosophers, philosophers and we got so much demolition from the Arab world. And the times was at a certain time because war was not always raging. In the south of Spain, the cathedral of Toledo, there the Muslim, they prayed to Allah on Friday. The Jews, they did it in the same church on Saturday and the Christians, they had their service on Sundays. I think this is a beautiful vision of the children of Ibrahim living together in peace and brotherhood. It took only a hundred years to make new wars and the Christians are much to blame because they started a lot of wars with the Crusades. So our hands are soaked in blood. We have killed each other off. This could be also the future for the next thousand years. I have another vision here for Denmark and Copenhagen. I should want my church, Holy Cross, like the cathedral in Toledo. In hundred, in thousand years, there will be Muslims on Fridays and Jewish service on Saturdays and the Christians singing in the Sundays. 
So we will look on the heavens. Maybe we have forgotten something. We are wondering. But the star world is over us. So we now have a little pause, I think, and then there will be questions to be answered. chance for Ahmed Didat to comment on some of the things that Eric Fox said and as we are ahead of schedule I think we would easily take that also now before a short break. down our throats as God. He didn't try to do that. In the Holy Quran, Christians, good Christians like these are being described. In chapter 5, verse 85, God Almighty, He says, وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقَرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا that the nearest in faith to the believers will thou find those who say Qalu inna nasara, that we are Christians. The nearest to the Muslims in faith will thou find those who say that we are Christians. Allah zina qalu inna nasara dhalika bi anna minhum kisisina wa ruhbanam wa annahum la yastakbirun for among them, among these Christians among them, there are men devoted to learning. Men who have renounced the world and they are not arrogant. And such example we do find even in our midst today. I think we should give a brother a clap. <laughs> this translation from which I read this ayah by Abdullah Yusuf Ali these volumes are available to Muslims and non-Muslims. Each and every one of us, we owe it to ourselves. Muslim, we must know our own faith and what can be better than the book of authority, the Quran. The non-Muslim, whether you want to know about Islam or you want to fight the Muslims, there is no better weapon than the Quran. If you want to fight the Muslims, here is the book. If you want to understand him better and tolerate him, this is the book. So from either point, you, we, everybody owes it to himself or herself to have access to this book of God. In the ayah I quoted, the verse I quoted, this man here, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, he comments. He says, the meaning is not that they merely call themselves Christians. There are over 1,200 million such people who fill up census forms Ticking off as Christian, 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 he says, no, not that. The meaning is not that they merely call themselves Christians, but they are such sincere Christians that they appreciate Muslim virtues. When you explain to them that we Muslims, we are taught, don't touch alcohol, don't gamble, don't be promiscuous, discipline yourself, fast, pray. All this, when the good Christians, he hears this, he says, no, you are good people. They admit that you people are good people. Your religion is good. If only you had Jesus Christ, all of you would be angels walking this earth. The only thing lacking is that you haven't got Christ. That's all. 
But otherwise, they do recognize Muslim qualities, brotherhood, piety, charity, sobriety. We are not angels. We also have a lot of black sheep in our midst, like any other religious group. But as a people, as a whole, in my country, I'm boasting and nobody ever contradicts me, the Muslims of South Africa. We say that we have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. We have the lowest gambling rate in the country. We have the lowest suicide rate in the country. We have the lowest prison rate in the country. And we have the highest charity rate in the country. And nobody can contradict us. They do appreciate that you people are good people. This is what it says. That you are, they are sincere Christians, that they appreciate Muslim virtues. As did the Abyssinians, whom Muslim refugees went during the persecution in Mecca. They would say, these Christians, they would say, it is true we are Christians, but we understand your point of view. That's all. We want them to say, we understand your point of view. And we know you are good men. So the translation, the translation, the commentator says, they are Muslims at heart. They are Mus whatever the label may be, is a label that's carrying, that's separating us, you know, dividing the people. But now they are Muslims at heart, and there are such good Christians living today. As Allah says, Min humul mu'minuna, among them there are mu'mins, good people, wa aksar humul fasid. But the majority of them, we know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they come and knock at our doors, they want to make mess on our heads, they want to use us as a punching bag. Yeah, there are people like that, but they are among the Jews and the Christians, Allah says. Min humul mu'minuna, they are our good people, wa aqtharuhumul fasikun. With regards to the debate, <laughs> with regards to the debate, Pastor, you know, made a statement that made my heart to flicker a bit. He used a quotation from the Bible where he says, I and my father are one. Character. He quoted, I and my father are one. And I said, here goes again. Because I have been asking Christians. When I say there is not a single statement, unequivocal statement, clear-cut statement in the Bible where Jesus says, I'm God, where he says, worship. Or where he says, me and God Almighty are one and the same thing. So some Christian reminds himself, he remembers, his mind is tickled. He says, no, 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 he did say, what? He said, I and my father are one. Means I and God Almighty are one and the same thing. So I thought, nah, here goes. But generally, my experience, whenever you ask the person, anytime any Christian tells you, I and my father are one, means he is God. Ask that person, what is the context? And believe me, in 40 years, I didn't come across a single learned Christian, DD or bishop or what, who could give me the context. In what sense did he say that? So, what you have to do, anytime anybody throws anything at you, what you do is go and look it up. My booklets are available. Christ in Islam. What the Bible says about Muhammad. Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. Muhammad, the greatest. Is the Bible God's word. Crucifixion or crucifixion. All these are there to arm you to carry out the discussion that you may promote Islam. Don't be waiting, sitting, target, sitting, duck, wherever you go into the world, waiting for the people to come along and use you as a punching bag. You want to come and mess, make a mess in your head. Don't allow that to happen. Arm yourself that you can reason with the people. Call them home for a cup of tea. And the Pakistanis, especially, I don't know about the Arabs, you know, what nice, nice things they have. You know, that you can give the tea, I don't know. But the Pakistani, I know they have the bhajjas and the samosas. You know, and I tell you, this bhajjas and samosas can enslave anybody. <laughs> Call them home, your neighbors, their families, says, come home, you know, we have our, our birthday for our child, or some big occasion, any excuse, get them home, give them the tea and the bhajjas and the samosas, your curry and rice, and you see what it does to the babies. You know, the Vikings, whatever they were at one time, but our curry and rice and our bhajjas and samosas, you know, you can, you can conquer them, Allah. You can conquer them.
Called them home after a cup of tea and a little light chat. He says, Do you know we believe in Jesus? Says, yes. Says, yes. Because they don't know. What are, you see, they don't, they are terrified of us. They think we don't know. Everybody is a terrorist. Everybody is a fundamentalist. We are out to bomb people and kill people. Wallah, we are very peaceful people. We are, you know. And, but they don't know. You see, they see us, we are inferiority complex, maybe. We are getting away out of the way, hiding away. So they think these guys are up to some mischief. Wallah, we have no mischief in them. Call them home, talk to them, show them the Quran, show them the birth of Jesus, open Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, ayah number 42, read it to them and let them read for themselves, lend them the Quran, what it says. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So behold, the angel said, O Mary, in Allah has tafaki, wa taharaki, wa tafaki ala nisa al alameen, that Allah has chosen you, purified you, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she's given such an honor in the Holy Quran, that honor is not to be found given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, even in the Christian Bible. Show it to them. Let them see with their own eyes. This is not we are trying to carry favor with you because we are your guests. We have come here because this country offers us opportunities we do not find in our own motherland. Therefore, we have come here. We are prepared to put our weight and share and see that this country prospers. But we have something more to give them our labor and that is we have a way of life. We want to share it with you. We want to show you that this is going to solve your problems. Your problems of alcoholism, drunkenness, your pro problem of illegitimate children, of incest. What I'm reading now, what I'm understanding that in the Scandinavian countries, incest is at its highest rate. Men with their own child, children, with their own little children. And they have just had to pass a law now. The thing was going on for thousands of years. But now they have just passed a law against incest. Man with his own child, with his own daughter. And the punishment, of course, they are very, very kind and gentle people. You know, two years jail. The guy should be beheaded. Anybody, whether he's a Muslim, whatever. This is what you do to your own child? You're worse than any, any animal on earth. You are a parasite. You should be destroyed. But no, of course, they have a training, you know, kind, merciful, gentle. Now we say, no, this is very good. It sounds very good. You people are very kind and compassionate. But look, this is not the law of God. God Almighty gives you a law. He says the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. I'm not saying that. This is the Holy Bible says. Why aren't you prepared to live up by your Bible? This is what the Holy Bible says. Book of Leviticus. The adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. But of course you have gone nice and soft. You don't want to implement the laws of God anymore. But we are suggesting to you that this human animal this is the only language that he understands. Let him, give him what he understands. Your compassion, yes, with the weak and the oppressed, yes. But parasites, you have to treat them as parasites. So Islam gives you solution to all your problems. Your problem of surplus women. By God, every Western nation has a surplus of women. As if God is wanting to take revenge on them. As if God wants to take a revenge. America has got 7.8 million women. More than men. If every man in America got married, there will be 7.8 million women who can't get husbands. Then of the manpower they have, 25 million gay sodomites. Another 25 million women can't get husbands. Can you imagine the mess that they are in? The prison population, 98% are men. I said, you have a problem. And it's getting compounded by the second. Britain, 4 million more women than men. Germany, 5 million more women than men. Russia, 7 million more women than men. I said, look, Islam offers you a solution. A solution to your problem. If you don't hearken to God's remedy, then you simmer in your soup. That's all. We have to educate them. I said, look, there is a type of man, the Dane. The mighty, the Vikings. You know? I said, there is a type of man among the Danes and the Swedes who's prepared to take on extra responsibility. And there is a type of woman who doesn't mind sharing a husband. But you're going to come in their way. 
you Westerners, according to your brainwashing, you're going to come in their way. But you do not come in the way of the Sodomites and the lesbians. I want to know why. The most unnatural thing you allow and the natural thing you forbid. No, we are not forcing it down your throat. We are only trying to reason with you that this is a solution to your problem. If you laugh at me, I said the laugh is on you. You are literally, I told the Americans when I was there, literally I said you are going to the dogs. And I repeated again and again, I said literally you are going to the dogs. Islam is offering you a solution. The problem of race, Islam answers the solution. Alcohol, it, surplus women, answers your problems. So what is it? It says, come, let us share. The Quran says, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, ta'ala. So, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, come. Come. We are asked to call them, which we are not doing. We haven't done it for a thousand years. That's why we are in a mess now, simply because we are not doing our job. Allah says, call them, ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa'in bainana wa bainakum. Then we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. Come, let us talk. Let us have a dialogue. That's what Allah tells us in the Quran. And the Bible also says the same. Come, let us reason together, which we have been doing tonight. And this type of meetings, gatherings, small groups, big groups, it should happen all the time. Let us share our feelings, our faith with the others. Let them see, let them agree to disagree. There's no harm done, but at least they said, now I can see how your minds are working. We too, they said, we want to know how your minds are working. So we also become more tolerant. So I'm looking forward to the pleasure and the privilege of many such meetings as we have tonight. May the Lord be with us. I happened to give the wrong information before. I said that we would have a short break. That is not according to the truth. I hope you'll forgive me for pulling your legs. Uh, because we will go straight on to the questions. I will invite the first question to come to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, let me present myself as a pastor, Arne Kappelgaard. And I'm thankful for the fair way that you try to open the discussion. Although I could, I would like to have heard you understand the context in so many of these places. I will not go into many details, just one. Have you not heard this context of the word, I and the Father is one, that Jesus called and uh, talked to the Jews, try to explain them step by step, slowly, what he is trying to tell them. Because it was so, just as hard for Jews to understand that what he was trying to tell about himself as it is for you. Because God is one. It took his disciples two and a half years to understand that at the same time he could say, I am both. I am also God, although I am a man. He was human, yes, and God. And when he said, I and the Father is one. The Jews stoned him, wanted to stone him at least. They understood perfectly well that he made claim to be God with these words, just as he did with the words, before Abraham was, I am. Have you not heard this context before? That is actually what I was referring to. You see, the Christian, to me, is reading out of context. What you have given me is the text. John chapter 10, verse 30. That is the text.
context means please don't waste time context means the text that goes with it before or after and i have been asking learned christians what is the context english speaking people what is the context and nobody seems to understand that simple english of mine i said what you quoted is the text i want the text that goes with it so they want to open the book i said no 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 please keep the book shut if you know your what you are talking about then you ought to know what the context is what is the context yes do you know sir look i don't want to embarrass you because i know people get embarrassed i said what is the context the, the text that goes with it without opening the book as a pastor sir you might remember in what sense did he say that in the sense that he was gradually revealing himself this was so, what was so hard to understand some people they accepted some rejected and got angry because they understood and nobody can say i and the father is one without being either a fool or be true you see so what you are doing now you are giving an explanation what i was asking for is the context let me give you what i what i explain to what i mean context starting from verse 23 what you quoted was 30 let's start from 23 there's a context it reads and jesus if you like to open the book if you like to have a look at it 23 and jesus walked in solomon's porch john 10 23 and jesus walked in solomon's porch meaning in the temple of jerusalem he's walking he's alone jesus not with his disciples he's alone then came the jews round about him meaning they surrounded him because this man jesus a mighty messenger of god he was provoked by the jews and he 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 criticized them very very strongly he says you generation of vipers you white sepulchers you fools you wicked and adulterous generation you brood of snakes and the jews were not the people to forgive you for that we know that they are unforgiving people so now they have their own time they have an opportunity they have an opportunity that here is a man he's alone let's give him a good bashing you know he's been calling us names so they surround him and they say how long does that make us to doubt if that be the christ tell us plainly am i right sir how long that means they're brandishing a finger in this in his face he say how long you're going to make us to doubt if you are a christ tell us plainly man In other words you are talking ambiguously you're not putting forth your claim clear enough that's the allegation the charge so Jesus says i told you and you believe not it's a lie you're uttering a lie against me that i didn't tell you i told you and you believe not the works that i do in my father's name they bear witness of me and my sheep hear my voice and i know them and they follow me and i give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish my verse 28 my father which gave them me is greater than, than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand verse 29 verse 30 i am my father are one that is the context meaning that once a person has accepted faith god sees to it that he remains in faith and i as a teacher as a master i see to it that they remain in faith we are both one in this to see that the man remains in faith not in omnipotence not in omniscience that he is a no, we are one in this to see that the man remains in faith but the jews were looking for trouble look they were out for a fight and there is a saying that if you are looking for trouble you don't have to go very far you get it around the corner am i right sir you are looking for trouble and before the you can say twinkling on your eye you are in it if you are looking for trouble so the jews were looking for trouble so they picked up stones again to stone him verse study one so jesus says many good works have i showed you from my father for which of those works do you stone me so they say for a good work we stone thee not 
but for blasphemy, because the thou being a man makes thyself a God. That's the context. Yes. What does Jesus say to that? You see, the first false charge was that he was talking ambiguously. Correct? That he was not putting forth this claim clear enough. He says, you're talking ambiguously. Come on, man, tell us. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. It means you're not doing it plainly. That's the first false charge. Second charge, you are now blaspheming. You are claiming to be God when you are a man. What is the answer? He says, he says, he says look, if I'm God, I say, I'm God. You say, you must have that you're the lecturer. I say, yes. Why should I be very good? Why must I beat around the bush? You did that? I say, yes. You're a lecturer of Islam? I said, yes. Why should I start beating around the bush? If I am. So, he say, they say, you are blaspheming. What does Jesus say to that? He says, is it not written in your law? In the Torah. Law, the word law. The law in English, in Hebrew is Torah. Is it not written in your law? In your law is sarcastic. It's also his law. Because he said, Matthew chapter 5 verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. It's also his law. But he says, Your law is sarcastic. In other words, you ought to know in your book. Like somebody said, look at in your Bible, sir. You know, that means in your, in your Bible. Maybe it's also my Bible. But it's your Bible. Have a look. So is it not written in your law? And he quotes from the 82nd Psalm. I said, ye are gods. It's a quotation. I said, ye are gods. He's quoting from the 82nd Psalm where God speaks to the Jews. He says, behold, ye are gods. And all of you are the children of the Most High. That's the quotation. In other words, he's quoting from the 82nd Psalm that this is our language, man. We talk like that. The Englishman is talking about the magistrate, the judge. He says, me Lord, me Lord, me Lord. Means my Lord, my Lord, my... Does he say my God, my God? When he says me Lord, what does he mean? He means, you know, respectable sir, respectable sir. But he's calling Lord, my Lord, my Lord. He's not his God, he's not his God. That is your language. In Afrikaans, in Afrikaans, I don't know how close it is to your Danish language, the, the white man's language. They say in Afrikaans, I'm quoting from the book of Isaiah, he says, Ek, Ek is the hero. And that is, Tain Heiland Beiten Meni. I, I am God. The word there is H E R E, hero. Hero means God, Lord. But it means God in, in the Afrikaans language. Hero, H E R E, hero. I don't know whether you have something like that in your language. Here, I, I am God and there is no savior besides me. But in Afrikaans, the word is here, God, I am God. This word also hot means God and here means Lord, meaning God. So now in, in, in South Africa, I don't know Afrikaans as a language, but I go to one of our cities, you look at me, brother, 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 I go one of two our cities where this Afrikaans is the predominant language and I go to the toilet and it's written there Dama, D-A-M-E, they, they pronounce Dama and H-E-R-E. To me, Dama, here. I said, Dama means ladies, here. But this door here, there's another door there. He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> this here is not here, it's here. You pronounce here means means gentlemen. But in the Bible, here means God. I said, you got toilets for gods in South Africa? <laughs> no, this is the genius of the language. Genius of the language. So Jesus is reminding them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If he, God Almighty, called them gods, unto whom the word of God came in the prophets, are called gods. In the book of Exodus, God speaks to Moses and says, Behold, I have made you a God to Pharaoh. Am I quoting correctly, sir? I have made you a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Is he God? Is Moses God? But that's what's written there in your Bible, sir. So in other words, this is the genius of our language. We talk like that, but we don't mean that. 
Is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If he calls them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, means you can't contradict me. The scripture cannot be broken. You can't contradict what I'm telling you. That's what Jesus told the Jews. You can't contradict me, what I'm telling you. Say ye of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world that thou blasphemest, because I said I'm the Son of God. In other words, it means nothing, man. Look, if a man is called God, you take no exception to that. Why are you taking exception to me when I say I'm the Son of God? That is what he's telling. Because God has got sons by the tons. By the tons in the Bible. He's got sons by the tons. So this is how he's reasoning. He's, if he was God, he said, look, I am God, so what else can I say? But he said, nothing of the kind. In the context, it is not what you understand. That is why he said, come, let us reason together. You don't have to accept my explanation. But I said, now, let, give me a hearing. Whatever you have to say, I said, now, I will explain. Okay, brother. Next question. Next question. Before you ask, before you ask, the chairman, I think he failed to, to explain that it should be as far as possible we're going to try one question for D Dad and one for the pastor. One for D Dad, one for the pastor. Okay? Okay. But, but nobody has any question for the pastor, then you can carry on. But we should be fair to both the speakers. One for me, one for you. <laughs> I will start by asking our respected guest, uh, guest Eric B. Bock, uh, if Jesus is God, and I mean God in inverted commas, how will you describe Adam, as we know, is a human without mother and father? Why don't you also describe him as God if you are consistent in your proclaims? This was a question for you and to our... Uh, one, one at a time. One at a time, good. There is uh, an Islamic uh, proverb, I think. Uh, I've heard it and uh, remember it so uh, greatly. It is about a father and son, uh, son in the Arab world. And there, the father, he shall see, the son shall see the father as the ancestor of Adam through his father and during the times he comes back to Adam and Adam was created by God he, he saw Was it God to Jesus who created Adam? Or was it God the Father? God the Father, he created Adam and in, in this way, in this way, uh, the, the son is in connection with God because Adam is created in the, like the father. Like the form of the father? Yeah. But why don't you call him a God also? Why do, don't you call Adam a, a, a God or kind of a God? When, he, when you call uh, Jesus uh, Christ a God, a son of God, why is the, this difference between them? Because Adam was, as we know, uh, created without a father or mother. So why don't you call him a God also? Yes, we don't do it. We have uh, one father in, in the heavens and we call him God, but I, I didn't end my proverb. Through, uh, through the son, when the father sees his son, he sees God too, eh? because forward in the future, the son is the connection with doomsday. So I, I saw this very clever, this Islamic proverb, and so it shows us a family, of the family of God, God's children. 
Now there will come many uh, questions forward. I see a line and there is a pile of papers. And um, uh, I'm glad that one of my colleagues uh, is here, Arne Kabelgaard, the, the man in the red. He's uh, my colleague from Nordbro. And now and then I'll call him to assistance. I may also call an, a friend, a prophet, called Eric Neuer, to assistance, maybe. But, uh, so go on and hit out. Please. Next question should be by the next questioner, and it should preferably be for Sheikh Ahmed Dida. So it please in one question for uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, one question for Reverend Eric Bach. Yeah, my name is Subair Mohammed, uh, Sir Ahmed Didat, Assalamu alaikum. So before I ask my question, I'd like to remind you, um, you made a statement about Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, that we Muslims should not wait for him. Uh, can you clear file uh, this please and tell us about is he coming or not? I don't think I said anything tonight about don't wait for Jesus. Did I say anything like that tonight? But what he's referring to is, do I believe whether Jesus Christ is coming? I said, yes, he's coming. What is he going to come and do? I said, I don't need him. I personally, I don't need him. I've got everything that I want, Allah wanted to give, he's given to me in the Quran. He can't come. So why should he come? What is he going to come and do? He can't teach you the Sharia. He can't tell you now Salat, Maghrib, instead of three, make four. You can't say, look, Fajr is two, two rakat, instead of make it four. No, he can't do that. Finish. So what can he come and teach you or me? Nothing. Right? This is, Allah says, Al yawma akmaltu lakum din. This day I have perfected for you your religion. Wa atmantu alaykum na'mati. And I have completed my favors unto you. Wa raditu lakum al Islam ad dina. And I will that Islam should be your religion. Finish. Then what is the human do? He's needed. Wallah, he's needed. But not by us. The Christians need him. You see, they have now made him into a God. So in the Gospel of St. Matthew, in the Bible, it's written there, Matthew. He says, many will say to me on that day, when he comes, his second coming. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, meaning God, God. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works? Who's doing all these things? Muslims? Muslims casting out devils in the name of Jesus? Are they performing miracles in the name of Jesus? Are they building hospitals and looking after the lepers in the name of Jesus? Are they? No. Who's doing that? The Christian. So Jesus is going to talk to the Christians. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name do many mighty works? Jesus is says, then will I profess unto them. Then I will tell them, I never knew you. Get away from me, ye that work iniquity. This is it. You are doing all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Lord. He says, get away, I don't even know you. This is what he's come to do. He said, you have gone off the track. Instead of worshipping God, the Father in heaven, you start worshipping me. Therefore, never mind what miracles you perform, you are not of me. Get away. He's needed. But he's needed by the one billion million people. Christians of the world, not by the Muslims. Yes, I am addressing you, Revere Derek Bok. Kindly tell me if Lord Jesus, during his lifetime, did ever say that he is the Son of God himself? Did he ever say? Quote authority from the Bible. Yes. Yes, I, I referred to, um, to this question at Caesarea Philippi, where 
Jesus asks his disciples, who do you think I am? And then Peter proclaims, you are the living Christ, the word of God. So there he proclaims himself God. And no, I don't catch the point, sir. You say that Peter says that you are God. I say you did not, you did not listen to my question. My question is, did Lord Jesus himself say with his own mouth that he is the Son of God? That is the question. Quote from Bible, please. Yes, uh, maybe I should call uh, my, my colleague, Pastor Anne Kabelgaard, because I'm not so clever. Anne Kabelgaard, he, he may come forward. <laughs> no, sir, I want you to quote from the Bible. Yes, uh, my colleague is uh, very mighty strong in the scriptures, which I'm not. <laughs> no, Jesus, we do not have these words. That is clear. But Jesus was a very good pedagogic, and he knew that it took a long time for people to understand what he was trying to tell. So he had to try to use three years to tell his closest friends. And even they had difficulty in understanding. He had to reveal it step by step. I'm the person who is uh, registered under the name of Erik Neuer, and I've been living up in a Christian, Christian society here in Denmark, but this society has declared me insane. It means that uh, they think that uh, I got no consciousness. But in fact, I, I've discovered that I got another level of consciousness. And for me, there's not only one way of looking at the world. You, you must, uh, know from which kind of consciousness you're speaking, because every consciousness has got its own definitions, its own limits, and therefore I think it, it's very difficult to, to, to speak about the heaven, uh, the experience of heaven out from a, a book, because you can read a description of the heaven in a book, but it's not the experience of heaven, and therefore I will ask uh, you as Jacques Ahmed did that, of, of the possibility of uh, agreeing in that there's, uh, there's uh, different levels of consciousness, that to know what God is, you must have the same consciousness as God. To know what is Son of Man, you must have the same consciousness of, as Son of Man has got. And that also, that the consciousness of God, it is the highest consciousness possible, but the consciousness of son of man is like it's a little it's a little lower but it's not different it, it's just a little polluted but in fact the, the the very inner of it it is the same and therefore you can say that the, the son and the father it is the same because it's the same in the mean of consciousnesses thank you All that was a bit too high for me. It was a bit too high for me to grasp. You know, for me, it was too high. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, the question, it will be for Mr. Eric Book. I want to know, as you said, that we drink the blood of Jesus and we eat from his body. As he was crucified, do you think, or from where have you bring his blood or his, the piece from, uh, from his body 
and you share it in the church. As you know, he is God, or other people think he is God. Please. Uh, as I understood, uh, you asked me how uh, the body and the blood of Christ can multiply through centuries. You said that we share and we drink, we eat from the body of Jesus. Yes. And yes. As, as he was, uh, 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 he was uh, raised up to the heaven, then from where we have drink his blood and his peace, from what you eat from his body? This is the question. <laughs> yes, a cunning question. <laughs> but because uh, we eat uh, the flesh of the air and the blood of the rising Christ. Jesus doesn't speak in the, as a desire, he doesn't speak in the air. Jesus doesn't speak in the air. He does not speak in... In the air, in the air. He often. He is... He often. He speaks through his word. And the word is the body of the spirit. So in this way we perceive his words to us. I know that uh, the communion, the eating of the flesh and the blood of Christ is a horrible thing for Muslims. It could be for some Christians too, but in this way we have a, a, a living remembrance of Christ rising among us. And when the pastor in the church, he lifts up the bread and the wine, then we believe that Christ comes in our midst and he is among us, not only invisible, but also in a visible way, like a, a sign. So this is our belief and um, you cannot swallow it, but so it is. As you said, uh, as you said uh, that uh, in the church we share the blood. Do you think if Jesus is still alive, do you think he will still drink from his blood and his body? Yes, he is still alive. He is uh, still among us. And he, is, he comes from the inside of us, from our hearts. Then how come the people can drink the blood of God? As they said, Jesus is God incarnate, or the Son of God incarnate. How come they can drink the body, his blood from the blood, the blood of God? How can they drink it? Because this is a ritual we have, a ritual which goes back into history, which is pagan in origin, when there was made great sacrificial eatings, and we were eating the flesh of, of the sacrifices. Now Christ, he has made the last sacrifice for us and we remember him in this way in our church. Uh, the question has maybe been fully answered by Thank now, so if we could move on to the next question, please. Sure. Assalamu alaikum. Actually, I have a question to Mr. Pork, but no, it's a law and regulation. I must ask the question to Ahmed Tida. How and when Injil become a Bible. When it is given a name, a Bible, when the original name was Injil. Uh, the question was that originally the books that were given by God Almighty were like, for example, Injil to Hazrat Isa Ali Salah. How has it become the Bible? Is that the question? You see, the trouble is with most of us, the Muslims. We don't know what the Christian is talking about. You see, the word Bible, Bible means a book. And he says that in the Arabic Bible, which they produced, they say Al-Kitab Al-Muqaddas. That is what they call this book. The Holy Book. It's our people, out of ignorance, they say the Torah, they say the Zabur, they say the Injil. They don't say that. But we are putting words into their mouth to tell us this is Torah, this is Zabur, this is Injil. 
They don't say that. This is Al-Kitab Al-Muqaddas in Arabic, Al-Kitab Al-Muqaddas in the Urdu Bible. That is what they say. So why don't you call it Kitab Al-Muqaddas? When I'm talking to people in the Arab world, and at times they want simultaneous translation. So the man is there standing side by side with another mic, and I say, the subject is what the Bible says about Muhammad. And the man translates what the Torah, in Arabic I can follow, the Torah says about Muhammad. I said, I didn't say Torah, I said Bible. She says, what the Injil, I said, I didn't say Injil, I said Bible. You see, the unfortunate part is, our people, we don't know that this is not the Torah, this is not the Injil, this is not the Zabur. Why don't you call it what they call it? In the Arabic Bible, they say, Al-Kitab al-Jadid, Al-Kitab al-Kadim, the Old Testament and the New Testament. That is what they say. You say Injil, you say Torah, therefore you just tie yourself up unnecessarily. So the thing is, the Bible is not the Torah, it's not the Injil. We believe that God Almighty revealed his messages to Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ. And that message what he revealed is the Injil. But what they are giving us is the gospel according to St. Matthew. You read there in the Arabic Bible, it says Injile Mar- Ma- Matthew, Injile Marcus, Injile Lucas, Injile Johanna. Right. We are believing in Injile Isa. There is no such thing. But now you start grappling with it. Injil is not, is they telling you Injile Marcus. This is the Injil of Marx or Matthew or Luke or John. Why don't you stick to that? So we are trying to run too fast when we should be just walking on this. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. My question is very simple. Who killed Jesus? Because there was a purpose. Second, Jews, they sentenced him to death, but they were not allowed themselves to carry out death sentence because they were occupied by the Romans. So the Romans were involved also. But I will say, even you and I are killing Jesus whenever we are doing against the will of God. But how can, how can you say that God allowed it to him be killed when he was God himself? I wouldn't like to die. I wouldn't like to kill myself. If I was a Jesus, if I could save myself, wouldn't you do it? out of love for you and me. It was the only way he could take away all the wrongdoings of humankind. Excuse me, where in the world that type of a logic exists, I would like to know. I will answer you, yes. In the letter which St. Paul wrote to the Philippians, chapter 2, from verse 6 to 11, I have to read that. In the letter to the Philippians, it is, I think, letter number four of Paul's letters, chapter two, from verse six. Let me read it in, in English. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, of keeping peace, that is the context. He who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, 
and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death of the cross. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But he humbled himself in order to take upon himself what rightly was upon you and me. But God raised him from the death. It was not defeat when he died, although it looked like that. But he was hiding his glory exactly because there he showed the most intense love of the world. Where does that type of love exist in the world today? And to Jesus kill your own, own child for the sake of the rest of the family's love. Where does it exist? If Jesus has practiced it in his life, it must be a set example for us. We must also follow. But where does it exist? He is the only without sin. So where does that type of logic exist? Uh, excuse me. Uh, these questions seem to take uh, quite lengthy answers and uh, even some of the questions tend to develop into more questions as uh, we go along. So in order to put a time limit, uh, we should maybe say that we have two more questions because we're already closing in on nine o'clock. So, two more questions, please. Okay. Uh, I get a story from Eric. A little, I'm a little confused. Uh, he said, Musa, uh, Moses, he, he has seen the fire in the jungle, and have, he has to go to see the fire. Then, when he goes there, he hears the sound of God, and he said, the God said to Moses, take your shoes off because you are in a holy place. My question is, why as you Christian, when you are in church, you never take the shoes off? Strange, I, um, I have never thought about it, but why uh, we don't take off the sho shows, really. But uh, in our church, we are not con considering the temple, the church, as a holy place that we have to take off our, our shows. Because we believe that the word is sanctifying the church. It is only the word which makes the church visible, the invisible church visible. And so we have it in our rituals. But um, I am glad you mentioned the words of Musa, because he heard the first revelation of the being of God. And Jesus, he's again and again, he says, I am, I am, I'm the wine, I'm the bread, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, I'm the door. So in this way, he is identifying with God and revealing God from God's innermost being. And in this way also, if I may mentioned Eric Neuer, who he was talking about the consciousness of the Son of Man. And uh, Sheikh Ahmad did, did that. He could not really uh, grasp the signification. It was too high. And we do not have the consciousness of Christ. We, you have to become like a child to enter the 
kingdom of heaven, says Christ. And in this way, like becoming a child, emptying yourself, you, you can experience the kingdom of God, which is experience. It is his words, more or less. I'd like to ask a question. I'd like to ask a question, but uh, I'd like to have a right answer first from you. Because in the beginning, you said that uh, when Jesus was talking, when he was 12 years old, he said, I am in the house of my father. And you said he is God's son when he was 12 years old. And then you said again after that when he was crucified, he was in pain, horror, suffer, because in true, he didn't know if he is son of God or not. So it was two points. You said that when he was 12 years old, you said that he know that he is God's son. And then you said when he was crucified, he was feeling pain and horror, then because he didn't truly know that if he is the son of God or not. And then your fellow come and said that it is not, he is not a son of God, he is God. So I'd like to have a straight answer from you first, so I can ask my question. Do you know him or you consider him as a son of God or you consider him as a God? If you answer me, I'll give you my question because I feel it's a little bit very much different than each other and against each other, the two of you. So tell me what you believe in and then I will ask my question. Uh, I believe Jesus is God and that he is son of God. What both? Is then he is the son. He is the son of God. And in the same time, he is the father. And the same time, he came to the earth. What you want to say? Tell me, because I like to ask a question. So tell me what you believe in. We say both of us that Jesus is God, part of the three Yun God, and that he is the Son of God. We do not say that he is the Father. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. It is too big for my mind to think that he is free and still one. Shortly you want to say that you believe in Trinity. Yes. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Yes. Okay, then my question is not to you. My question now will be to Mr. Didat because he explained this point before many times and he's better to explain it to you and to your fellow better than me. Please explain that to them, Dr. Didat. See, the Holy Quran tells us to tell them don't say Trinity. This is puppet. It will be better for you. Wahid for your God is one God. He is not three in one. And this is the evidence we have from the Bible. This verse on the Trinity, you have it there in that Bible of yours, I know. That is the authorized King James Version, the English one that you have. And then your Danish one is also based on the authorized. King James Version. This is not the right. Now, there you find in the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. First epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. First epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. Where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Am I correct, sir? No. What does it say? <laughs> <laughs> there are three witnesses, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and the three agree. Right. Now, that is the revised version of the Bible. <laughs> that one now, if you say it's not the King James Version, that is the revised version. Okay. Right. It, so well, it is a Danish version, right. but similar. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. The English, when you read in the Danish one, that may be based on the revised version. Now, here is the revised version of the Bible, done by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, 
of Christendom and that verse is now thrown out as a fabrication. That that verse that you are reading actually was a marginal note made by certain visions of Thapsus in the 6th century for his own edification or for his children and that when the people were given for printing those words crept into the main text. So they have now been thrown out as a fabrication in the revised standard. Every modern translation, Moffat translation, New World translation, revised version, revised American version, they are all thrown it out as a fabrication. That this is not supposed to be the book. Then, you see, you go to this man himself, the master himself, Jesus. In, in the Gospel of St. Mark, brother, in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 19, I'm sorry, Mark, chapter 9, verse 12. You'll you, you build this out. A Jew comes to him and questions him. He says, Master, what commandment is the first of all? You remember the sense. Master, Rabbi, in the Hebrew language, what commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answers and says unto him, the first is. You remember that? The first is. In Hebrew, he must have spoken in Hebrew to his people. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord is one. Is that the answer he gave? Yes. Right. Jesus Christ is questioned, what commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answers and says unto the Jewish learned man, scribe, a learned man, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord is one not three in one. That was the right time. If he came to preach Trinity, he should have said, you see, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we three are one, you have to believe in that if you want to be saved. He said nothing of the kind. He repeats word for word what was given by Moses 1300 years before, without the change of a thought. Not one jot or one tittle, he says, shall pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do, shall be called great. So, the teaching of Jesus, he never taught you that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, but there are not three gods, but one God. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible, any Bible, there is no such statement, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, but there are not three gods, but one God. Is there any such thing in the Swedish Bible, Danish Bible? That the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy that's what you say in your family and in your church. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, but there are not three gods, but one God. Is there such a statement in the Bible? In your Bible, sir? No. I know in my Bible it doesn't exist. It's not there in my Bible. No, but there are so many different bits that when they are fit together, they can only fit the greatness of God in this way. But God is greater than our logic can keep in one word. But this God says, it says, your book says, sir, that God is not the author of confusion. Am I correct, sir? This is confusion. No. But it is key. As time is uh, running, and I believe there's a number of us who have other things to see to as well, like families, uh, for instance. Uh, we have had the, the last two questions, and I'm sorry there's still even so many questions. But as I can see from the pile of questions, many of these questions are directed to Reverend Eric Bach. And as I believe most of the people here live in or nearby Copenhagen, I am sure that Eric Bach would be willing to answer these questions any time to anybody who raises these questions to him at any other time. I'd like to thank Sheikh Ahmed Didat for his comments, for his lessons to all of us. I'd like to thank Reverend Eric Bach for his contribution and Reverend and a couple more also for his for his support to his colleague here.
and I think we have all enjoyed this debate greatly. Thank you very much for your attention.